Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Julie Renault Evans. I'm a program director with the Northern Forest Center coming to you from my home office in Northern New Hampshire, trying to appreciate another rainy day and all the gifts that it brings us. First, I wanna let you know that this webinar will be recorded and shared with you for future watching. And please feel free now to add your name to the chat. Tell us uh, your name, perhaps your organization or affiliation and your lo location. That gives all of us a feel for who's joining us today and the audience that'll be listening. Our format today will be for a panel introduction. We have three panelists joining us today. And then we'll have a panel discussion between all of us. And then we'll follow that with questions and answers. As we're going through our discussions and you have a question, please put it into the Q&A function and we'll get to that towards the end of the session together today. So today we are gathered for our webinar entitled The Crossing Paths of Recreation and Forest Management. This is part of the center's Building the New Forest Future webinar series and we try to amplify stories, practices, and lessons from the areas of community development, sustainable tourism, and forest economy within the region known as the Northern Forest. In this series, we aim to feature communities and organizations that have demonstrated innovation and progress in critical sectors. Open access to public and private lands is a proud tradition in the Northern Forest region. Historically, paper companies with vast ownerships welcomed the use of their properties for hunting, fishing, and snowmobiling. Thousands of camp lots were leased to company mill employees in the backwoods and on the shorelines of many lakes and ponds deep in the forest. Likewise, we had many uh, public lands develop over time, including national forests and state lands. Today, Interest in outdoor recreation can, continues to increase in the area, and the center supports and advocates for responsible enjoyment of the forested landscape, especially for non-motorized hiking, walking, biking, and skiing. We've seen the communities in the region benefit immensely from recreational investment and use, and we believe it is absolutely a complementary benefit to other forest uses, such as timber management, habitat maintenance, and water quality control. I think this is our third webinar with a focus on recreation in the Northern Forest region. We started in November 2021 when we hosted a discussion about connecting trail works with downtown businesses for both benefits for both the recreationalists and the small communities. And then last year, my colleague Mike Wilson facilitated a panel discussion about the challenges and opportunities of recreation on private land in which we featured both recreation organizations and private landowners. Today, we want to dive a little bit deeper into the tensions and opportunities of recreational use, specifically on lands with active timber management programs, both on public and private lands. We'll explore what this relationship looks like and how it can be additive rather than competitive. We'll also examine how recreation on both public and private lands has changed. Perhaps we need some new management approaches and how landowners can educate visitors about forest systems, forest management, and harvesting. Our panelists today include Josh Schostrom, who's the district ranger of the Androscoggin District of the White Mountain National Forest. Josh will give us an understanding of balancing many uses on federal land within close proximity to many people seeking recreation. Then we'll speak to Hannah Stevens. She is the land use director for Seven Islands Land Company, and she administers the public use program on their 820,000 acres of privately owned and managed forest in Maine. Ethan Tapper will join us. He is the Chittenden County Forester for the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. Chittenden County is near Burlington, Vermont. And he's going to give us a perspective of small private landowners and also his experience with town and community forests, specifically as they manage recreational use. So we're going to start with Josh. So Josh, if you would please come on camera and introduce yourself. Good morning and uh, uh, thank you, Julie. Um, I have some introductory comments. Um, 
So as Julie mentioned, I'm the district ranger up here on the Androscoggin Ranger District of the White Mountain National Forest. Uh, we're in the eastern region, region nine of the national forest system. Um, I'm responsible for the management of about 200,000 acres uh, of national forest land situated in the northern presidential range of the White Mountains. Um, also, we have lands in the Kilkenny region up towards Berlin and Stark, New Hampshire. And then uh, we have lands in Maine along uh, Route 113 in Evans Notch. Um, I want to talk a little bit or I'll first I'll give the mission of the United States Forest Service, which is uh, to sustain the health, diversity and productivity of the nation's forests and grasslands to meet the needs of present and future generations. And you can see we manage approximately 193 million acres. Uh, most of that land, uh, about 80 percent of it is uh, is out in the West Coast and the uh, Rocky uh, mountains region of the United States, uh, but we do manage about 20% of the nation's forests. Um, you can change slides. Um, and so, you know, based on that mission, uh, a central theme to our management has always been uh, that it's multiple use. And so, um, by nature, that means that we uh, have to do a lot of formal planning and formal public uh, planning. So, uh, in order to avoid and sometimes lessen um, unnecessary uh, conflict between uses. Um, and so we manage lands for timber uh, and other forest products. We have recreation, forest wildlife, uh, special use permits like ski areas on national forest lands, um, clean water, and, and many other, any use you can imagine, any ecosystem service that comes uh, from our uh, national forests. And so, you know, in today's theme, recreation management, of course, is a, a major uh, part of what we do and where that intersects with uh, the other uses. So we generally on the White Mountain National Forest, we see about six to seven million uh, user visits in this kind of 800,000 acre uh, land base uh, per year. And so we're we're situated within a day's drive of most of the major cities on the on the East Coast. And so um, that's a huge population and lots of uh, pressure on the resource. Um, and so we have, as you can see from this slide, um, lots of hiking trails. We have lots of snowmobile, snowmobiling, downhill skiing, um, dispersed camping has become and is continues to, to grow um, as a use. Uh, ice climbing, we have Tuckerman Ravine on this district. And so a um, huge history of uh, the ski industry here in, uh, in New England. Um, and also the largest campground east of, or largest federal campground, I should say, east of the Mississippi up here at the Dolly Cop um, campground. So that's a little bit uh, about what we'll be talking about today. I, and, you know, I was requested to kind of raise at the outset just a couple of things I think about as a manager um, as we're moving into um, into the topics today when it comes to recreation. Um and its intersection with, with timber is basically when you're managing, um, much of our recreation occurs on steep slopes in this part of the, the, um, the forest at least. And so uh, a lot of it is over the slope requirements uh, based on New Hampshire and Maine BMPs as well as our, our forest plan, was it, which is our central document for how we decide to do things. Um, and so a lot of uh, that recreation is, is not going to be impacted just based on the, the steepness of the slope. Um, other things I want to talk, mention about recreation we're thinking about is finding workforce to manage is, is something we are concerned with. Um, housing, for example, as we sort of shift economies that way. Um, Long-term costs of infrastructure is something we think about a lot and you probably see in the news quite a bit, but maintenance of uh, rec facilities. Um, and kind of the last thing is the uh, great relationships that we have with our user groups and volunteers who help to manage this resource. Um, and so invested and folks that really that uh, the land means a lot to um, often assist with the maintenance and uh, critical to the success and the, uh, the health of the land. And with that, I will uh, end my comments. Josh, stay on camera for a second. I have a question for you, which is 
You talked about six to seven million visitors to the White Mountain National Forest each year. That is an incredible number of folks visiting us. I know that the Northern Forest region is in close proximity to the urban populations of Boston, New York, uh, even Montreal and Washington, D.C. How does the White Mountain National Forest differ from other national forests across the country in that recreational demand? Oh, we don't. We are one of the the highest recreation forests in the country, and so I think it a lot of it does just depend on proximity. You know, an, an example: I previously worked on the El Dorado National Forest um, out in California, which is pretty close to San Francisco, uh, as well as um, Sacramento and the Tahoe area, and so we saw a major uh, influx of folks through the, the highways there as well, um, but in so I, I do. I think it really depends on the um, how close a drive it is to the urban populations. Right. And would you say that our visitors understand that they're visiting a national forest and not a national park because of that high level of visits? It's often treated like a park, would you say? I, yeah, I would say that. I would. Uh, a lot of people don't know that we are uh, under the Department of Agriculture as opposed to the Department of uh, Interior. And so, uh, yeah, <clears throat> there's definitely a, a mindset that some folks from uh, visiting from other uh, parts of the country or, you know, people come from all over the world um, and maybe don't make that uh, delineation. They just know that it's public lands. Um, you know, our mission, if you if you go back to that, is one of multiple use. And so we, we do uh, provide a whole range of ecosystem services uh, aside from just that recreational experience. And so I think we're uh, we have a lot of um, history and a lot of experience in managing uh, some of the conflicts that may arise. Very good. Thank you so much, Josh. That was a great introduction. All right. So now we're going to invite Hannah to come on screen and introduce herself and her work. Thanks, Hannah. Hi. Thanks, Julie. And thanks for having me today. Um, as Julie said, I'm Hannah Stevens, Land Use Director at Seven Islands Land Company. And I've, I've been here since 2012 and Land Use Director since 2019. Um, and much of my role is administering our public use programs on our land, um, which I'll discuss a little bit in a minute. Um, so Seven Islands manages 820,000 acres in northern and western Maine. And you can see on the slide there that most of that land is north of Baxter State Park. And then we have some other holdings um, over in the Rangeley area in western Maine. Uh, most of it is in the unorganized territory, so it's it's pretty remote, remote region. Um, not much else there except uh, timberland management, especially in the northern northern region. Um, we manage for a single uh, single ownership. It's a family ownership that's um, had land since the 1840s in Maine, um, and the eighth generation of ownership is now here and they're still very involved and interested in all the all the things that are going on on their land. Seven Islands was founded in 1964 and we'll celebrate our 60th anniversary next year. Um, they were founded just to be the management arm for the family that we manage for. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, anyway, 60 years next year. Uh, in 2001, most of the land that we managed was put into a conservation easement with New England Forestry Foundation. Um, it's a working forest easement, um, restricts development on the property. There isn't much in there for a recreation clause. It really just says that we will you know, continue to provide foot access on our property. We are a dual certified sustainable forest under FSC and SFI. So we're held to certain standards under those programs. And that's, you know, a consideration that we have to think about when we're allowing public use and, and things that could happen negatively in that public use that could affect um, environmental standards or, or other things like that. So our, our land base is primarily for timber management, but multi-use is also important to our landowners. Um, but timber is how the uh, income is generated and it pays for things, including our roads that the recreationists um, 
use and utilize. And we have thousands of miles of roads and I should have a number there for how many thousands of miles of roads, but I don't. Um, we have close to 400 leases. Julie mentioned uh, that large ownerships often have a, a large number of leases and we have about 400 and that includes private camp leases, sporting camps, campgrounds, snowmobile trails, um, and the like. Uh, traditional uses are allowed, hunting, fishing, snowmobiling, camping in designated locations um, are all allowed. Uh, so we also have a few special events that we have uses that we don't normally allow, like we don't allow uh, bicycles typically on our roads, but we do have one yearly event in the Rangeley region that we allow bikes on our roads and the money raised from that race go to local nonprofits. We have a road rally, which is a rally car race that goes over part of our ownership. We don't typically allow very fast cars on our lands. So that's again, a sort of a one-off annual event that happens. Um, I need to mention that in Northern Maine, uh, North Main Woods is handling much of the recreation that takes place there. They're managing 3.5 million acres of uh, landowners. Um, so we're 600 plus thousand acres in that, uh, but they have they have checkpoint fees and those fees go to just go to managing the campgrounds. Um, our campsites and other things like that. None of the money gets comes back to the landowner per se. So road damage or anything like that, that that's that's on us. But they are instrumental in um, managing the recreational use of that area. Um, and they get about 200,000 visitor days to all of North Main Woods, which includes us and other landowners. Um, so yeah, some some trends I've noticed in the past few years are uptick in certain things like off-trail snowmobile in our Rangeley district, um, increase of traffic during COVID, like Ethan mentioned, uh, or Josh mentioned, excuse me. Um, and that seems to have stayed somewhat that there's more traffic now since COVID that people outside. Um, some more pressure for, for uses like ATVs, um, cycling, things that we, we don't allow at this point, but receiving more requests and sometimes some, some overflow from other, other areas that are receiving pressure. So, so that, that's my opening comments, I guess, and any questions you have. Thanks, Hannah. That's great. We'll, we'll get back to you with the full group in a minute. Ethan, can you join us now and introduce your work in Vermont? Thank you. Sure. Hey, y'all. Um, my name is Ethan Tapper. I'm the Chittenden County Forester for the Vermont Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation. Um, so for those of you who, are, who aren't from Vermont, we don't have county government here in Vermont. But what the County Forester Program is, is it's a, a program run at the state level. We're all state employees. There's 13 of us for Vermont's 14 counties. And it was established in the 1940s basically to, to help private landowners manage their private forest land. So like a lot of parts of the Northeast, you know, Vermont, we're 75% forested, 80% of those lands are privately owned. And so we have a tremendous public interest in managing those private lands responsibly. And so county foresters are essentially service foresters. I say that my job is basically four things. Um, we manage our state's current use program. So I administer about 800 parcels enrolled in that program in Chittenden County. Landowners who have more than 25 acres of forested land can agree to enter the program. They get a big tax break in exchange for managing their land uh, in accordance with a forest management plan developed by a licensed consulting forester and approved and monitored by the county forester. Um, so that's a, a big part of our time here in Vermont is managing that current use program. Uh, we also provide service to landowners, whether they're enrolled in that program or not. So if you just have a few acres or a few thousand acres, you can call your county forester up and we'll just provide free advice for you about how to manage your land. Maybe go take a walk, talk about what's going on, um, opportunities for responsible management, stuff like that. Number three is we manage these community forests, town forests, forests that are owned by a municipality. Um, 
all different shapes and sizes. In Chittenden County, there's about a dozen of them, and they cover about 4,500 acres. Many of them are conserved. Most of them have some recreational use, and most of them um, have some historic or current forest management use as well. So that's number three. And then number four, I say, is just sort of answering this question of how do we improve the health of forests and the quality of forest management in our county with the people that we have and the forests that we have? Chittenden County, you know, we're, we're one of 14 counties in Vermont, but we are a quarter of its people. We surround Burlington, which is Vermont's biggest city, um, even though it's still pretty small. Uh, and um, so what I've gotten really interested in is education and outreach. So I manage those community forests a lot of times with this big outreach process. So I do lots of public events. I just checked, and this is my 41st public event this year. Um, I write a monthly column in 10 community newspapers, a quarterly column in Northern Woodlands Magazine. I have a YouTube channel um, and, you know, do a lot of these other, create other resources and, and stuff like that for people to learn about forest and forest management. And that's, that's, a big part of my job for other county foresters, they're interested in other things, and they might sort of answer that that question differently. Recreation, um, I'm thinking about it a lot right now because I actually have a forest management project that's active on a town forest, the Catamount Community Forest in Williston, Vermont, that is highly used, tens of thousands of trail users a month um, for walking and hiking, bird watching, and especially mountain biking, and then skiing in the wintertime. And thinking about this question of, you know, how do we balance forest management with recreational trail use, right? So, you know, I think it, I think it's important at times as forest managers that, you know, recreation, managing groups that recreate on a property, managing, working around trails, trying not to impact trails or trail use can be a pain in the butt. Um, but trails are also an asset. Like most people, the way that they learn to value and love forests is on a trail, almost everybody, right? And so I am really, really interested in how we, um, you know, turn the relationship between recreation and forest management from something that is, you know, at times antagonistic or at, be at best, you know, sort of like live and let live to something where we're really benefiting each other. And uh, the way that I've handled that, I could talk more about this um, when we get into the Q&A section, but really leaning into education and outreach in places where there's recreational trail usage and we're doing forest management. So this project at the Catamount Community Forest, I've been doing outreach in preparation for this project for three years, um, marked all the trees a year in advance, put up educational interpretive signage a year in advance um, that says what all the different markings mean and provide QR code links to videos and articles and other resources. Um, just to provide some information about what's going on. Uh, hosted 20 public events, wrote four articles, four press releases, created 15 YouTube videos about the project, a couple of television appearances, all to just sort of like help the people who are using those trails, who are gonna be impacted by forest management work, um, and then you know are gonna be witnessing that forest management work. And we want this forest management to be something that shows them how good forest management can be and we want them to have all the tools to understand why we're doing what we're doing, even though it can be really counterintuitive, uh, rather than it to be another example of something that they don't like, right? Another example of why forest management is not a part of their world. Um, and so, yeah, I've worked with a bunch of different communities. Um, it's sort of trying to answer that question and have a lot more examples, sort of case studies of, of trying to figure that out. Thanks, Ethan. That's quite a project. And Ethan told me that all of that work was for a harvest that's going to take about two weeks. So, so hopefully people see it and have learned from it and appreciate it. Great. Thanks. Let's have all of our panelists come back on camera and we'll chat for a little while together. I do have a series of questions that I'll pose, but I want to remind the panel that I'm looking for um, interactive uh, participation as well. So if you have a question for a fellow panelist, please speak up. That'll be great. We'll just see where the discussion takes us today. Again, thanks for um, all being here and for giving us your perspectives. And uh, And we've got pretty good geography covered. No New York, and I apologize for that. Uh, but well, let's start with this question. You, uh, Some of you sort of hinted about this in your introductory remarks, but 
How do you see recreation complementing or hindering other management objectives or uses on your lands? I, I can start with that, Julie. All right, go ahead and then we'll go to Hannah. Sure, I mean, I, you know, like I said, I think, you know, what I'm really interested in is educating people about what forest management is in a nuanced way, you know? And so I think to the extent that we can leverage recreation, you know, turning recreational trail users who might traditionally be pretty focused just right on the trail into conservationists, you know, and people who care about protecting land and wildlife biodiversity, um, making sure our forests are resilient and adaptable in a changing climate. I mean, that is an asset to all of us. You know, it's not about just trying to like have recreational trail users think that any forest management is okay, you know, like, but it's, it's about trying to educate them about that forest management is actually a part of how we solve all of these really complex problems, protecting our biodiversity, you know, making our forests resilient, sequestering and storing carbon, um, having clean water and clean air, you know, having conserved land that, that creates this beautiful working landscape. Um, all those things, you know, are, are all pieces of the same puzzle. And so I think that that's really the opportunity. I think that that remains, you know, in my experience, largely something that that is yet to be really actualized. Um, the the challenges with, with recreation at times, and I'm dealing with this on this project I'm working on right now, is that um, we need to understand when we're creating recreational infrastructure, right, that our ability to manage forests is also important. So what I see a lot of times is like recreational infrastructure that's laid out without respect to the fact that this forest will be managed sometimes. So like if you put a mountain bike trail right on a skid trail, you're creating a situation that is going to be a conflict. You know, it's going to be a conflict in that it's going to preclude recreational trail use for some amount of time while that project is active. When you eventually do some forest management, it's going to create bad feelings, right? When Maybe some, you know, as they use that skid trail, maybe it's impacted in some way, it changes, the recreational trail users don't like the way it, the, it's changed. Um, and, and neither of those things are things that we want, right? So if we can be smart about, you know, the way that we're planning our recreational trails, you know, and recognizing that, that can be a real asset. But um, more often than not, I see that, you know, we have these, these recreational, trail, re recreational trail infrastructures that are, you know, sort of don't think about forest management necessarily as as an as another use that will be an issue. You know, one of the problems with that, right, is that the long intervals between entries at times. But I think, yeah, it's not for me, you know, what's also important to share with those people is that it's not just about like our ability to extract resources from the forest. It's also about our ability to respond to climate change, right? And to protect wildlife. And if we want to do that, you know, commercial forest management is this incredible tool that we have that requires infrastructure. And if every time we have to go in to do something in the forest it requires us to have this massive conflict with, with recreation, that's not a good thing. Very good, thank you, Ethan. Hannah? Yeah, I think from the large private landowner perspective, we are, our sort of philosophy is that we are allowing for multiple uses, but we're not promoting recreation and so we are really on the side of sort of managing that there aren't conflicts and that sort of thing so we're coming from a little bit different perspective I think in that way um, but we do see you know some of these uses is compatible like I said the traditional uses and it can be an opportunity to discuss what we're doing how we're managing with individuals that either run into, you know, our foresters on the land base, our lessees, you have a lot of questions when harvests are occurring near them or, um, you know, hunters, other recreation groups. So I see that as a, as a positive thing. It's a way to reach people um, in a somewhat low entry way because it's just having conversations on the ground. Um, and also we see it as, you know, you know, places like that are closer to towns and communities like our Rangeley uh, region. Um, recreation is, is, is making these places that folks want to live. And, and we're all aware that we need people in these rural places for, for our own workforce. And so that's a big part of, um, I think, 
the positive aspect of it um, because those folks that are going to maybe work in the forest industry want, you know, are the same people that are going to have an appreciation for the outdoors and, and an interest in recreating on the land. So, um, so then that on the flip side, you know, the same things that we hear about all the time, about roads are expensive and, and increased traffic is, is expensive and we're not really getting, you know, monetarily any, any help there. And so we have to balance how much we allow, how much we have to change our management to account for something like a trail or something like that. And we have to always balance the, the risks and rewards of, of how much, you know, public access we're, we're allowing, but so that's, that's my thought. So Hannah, so as, so in accommodating recreational use, um, and it not being your primary uh, management uh, focus, mm -hmm. do you do you have recreational buffers around either your uh, camp leases or an established snowmobile quarter, et cetera, which in effect is a loss to you in terms of management? So we we don't <laughs> really. Um, we work very closely with snowmobile clubs. Um, if we need to reroute a trail, uh, we're very proactive about meeting with them and them with us to say, you know, this is what we're going to do. And snowmobile trails are 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 good um, for us in a way that you know they're not on our main roads or anything, and so we right. can. It's pretty easy to we can reroute. reroute. Yeah. Um, so. And other trails, we don't actually have, you know, sanctioned hiking trails, which right. is another another reason was is because to buffer those or or whatever it would it would be a, a loss to the the land we could have under production. So, yeah, very good. Thanks, Josh. Did you want to add anything to this question? Yeah, sure. You know, I think from a, a public land management perspective, we do have a lot of competing uses and a, a, a responsibility to a lot to provide recreation to the public. I think um, we are, though, very well equipped with um, with policy, actually, that kind of supports how we manage the land and how we involve the public in that process and other user groups and um, interested parties. And so um, I think it, that is the key for us and try to avoid some of these conflicts is that we have a forest plan where not only kind of like spatially on the landscape, we have general forest available for certain activities. And then we have wilderness and we have other sort of in between that in terms of management. So we um, and that is a public document that was, um, you know, a decision was made on it through an environmental impact statement. And so everything that we do is is guided by that. So it's a nice starting point for us in the public. Um, and then as we kind of make smaller decisions, um, we can base it on that and involve the public, get to a, a starting point. Um, but our from a, a public lands perspective, it, it's just the key is uh, a lot of communication and a lot of um, knowing who the users are and making sure that we're involving people uh, very, very early in those uh, planning uh, processes. And we call it the left side of the NEPA triangle. So like the pre-planning before mm -hmm. you get to the decision making um, and then implementation. And besides that good planning, I assume you have very integrated teams, right? So you have mm -hmm. recreational folks working closely right. with timber management, working closely with the wildlife people, right? And all of that uh, implementation. Yeah. yeah, that's right. We have wildlife biologists, engineers, hydrologists, um, soil scientists, and each project has an interdisciplinary team um, that meets to review, you know, foresters obviously are a, a huge driver of that as well, so. Great, thanks. So let's uh, see if we have some uh, small stories about conflicts that you might have experienced between recreational and particularly timber management or timber harvesting or generally other management pieces on any of the properties that you've worked on. Anybody that got a conflict story they'd like to share? And of course, the next follow-up question is going to be about resolving those conflicts, uh, both specifically or generally. So 
who has a story they'd like to share about a conflict and its resolution? Oh, come on. I know you got one. I'll, I'll kick us off with a real easy one. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> I think, and hope maybe the other um, folks can provide examples of this too. I think Hannah just sort of mentioned, but in the wintertime, you know, we're being pushed to doing a lot and maybe just by ease of, uh, of use anyway, but lots of winter timber sale operations. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so with that, we're seeing in some instances where we're uh, hauling across um, snowmobile trails or needing to use uh, snowmobile trails for the treatment area. And so that in some cases, in, and again, I'm sort of, um, I guess, qualifying this because we see these problems like five years in advance in some some cases i'm not saying we catch everything but we're able to kind of like identify that out of the gate and like get the state involved get other the um, snowmobile clubs who are incredibly proactive um and kind of say hey we're we've got some uh, operations here that we're trying to decide whether it's feasible or not and then you know perhaps do a a closure for the weekend or excuse me during the week in some cases it impacts timber operations where we'll close them on holidays and weekends and so the, mm -hmm. the haul activities can only happen sort of during the the middle of the week um, but there are things in our plan for example where we do not close or we very strongly advised against closing um, the main corridors uh, uh, snowmobile corridors and so we kind of are able to plan around that so that decision is made ahead of time um, there are instances where we can uh, change potentially the forest plan if we want to do an amendment but i would it doesn't happen very often if at all but i think that's just a not a specific example but the timber sales in the winter and snowmobiles is something that comes up every winter i would say right and it sounds like having uh, planning time ahead, <laughs> being able to talk to the right people and coordinate makes makes a lot of difference in, in success of that. Hannah or Ethan, do you have stories to share? I have a story and um, I feel like I'm picking on snowmobilers, <laughs> but um, it's just a heavy use uh, for us in our Rangeley district and it's outside of our sort of North Main Woods management. So these issues, you know, are off in my mind. Um, and ours was more around um, off trail riding and, and infrastructure um, in that we've got a lot of trails that come in from town that kind of lead out into um, our ownership. And we had a, a big problem a couple of years back with folks instead driving in on our roads, parking their trailers you know, in hindering truck traffic. And mm -hmm. so there's a few things going on. Lots, thousands of snowmobilers landing in Rangeley. I think um, possibly some New Hampshire laws around off-trail riding has pushed folks uh, further into Maine. Um, and then uh, some of the, you know, manufacturers of big mountain sleds <laughs> which are, they're kind of pushing that, but they're not great for, for trails. And so those trails get pretty beat up from town into the back country. And so people are kind of skipping and, and parking, you know, right on roads. And, and we've had trucks that have had near misses with, or, or not even able to get through and having to call a forester and say, I can't even get by. So we work really closely with the uh, snowmobile club there to get the word out that, you know, there's no parking allowed. We put signage up. We work closely with the IFMW, the warden service, um, to even to get the wording on the right uh, of the signs correct so that it's enforceable, which is also a thing. Right, right. So, so we're still kind of working out solutions for that issue and whether that's figuring out on our land or someone else's land where we can have a parking area or and then you worry about overflow. So it's just kind of, you know, a chain of events. So I would say it's it's somewhat resolved now that we've kind of made it a clearer policy not to park uh, and to block uh, traffic, but still it's ongoing every year working with the snowmobile club and working with, um, you know, 
adjacent landowners to try to figure out how to relieve that. So, so is this a new trend? This interest in off the trail, like they just want to get loose in the woods, right? Is that what you're talking yeah. about? I, yeah, it seems it seems at least to be increasing, um, and it's and it's it's partly I think and I'm not a snowmobiler myself, but it's partly some of the sled um, are are built for that and then being sold and promoting them. So, you know, it's fun. It looks fun, <laughs> right. but, but it, it can cause, you know, issues. So. Right. Very good. Ethan. Yeah. I'm just thinking about, I, I guess I wouldn't say that this is a conflict in the sense that it, I don't feel that it's gotten antagonistic. Um, but you know, with this, this project that I'm working on right now, which is just really at the top of my mind, you know, um, the way that this works is that this is a 400 acre conserved forest. It's owned by the town of Williston, but just since 2019 um, was previously owned by this outdoor center that then when the property sold to the town of Williston reorganized as a nonprofit and they have a license agreement over the trails. So like they have the right to use those trails and we have the right to do forest management to close those trails when necessary. But if we do any damage to those trails, we're on we're on the hook for paying that cost, you know, and and in some of these areas like their, you know, old woods trails that were improved with road fabric and pea gravel way out into the woods to make these like really nice handicap accessible trails, which, of course, are also right where this good trail is supposed to be. Um, so there was a lot of anxiety, obviously, on their part. We you know we also had to do this job in the summer. Um, because we wanted to get some scarification. It's pine sight. Um, scarification, for those of you who don't know, is just disturbing the top layers of the soil, which is really helpful for regenerating certain species of trees. Um, and so we can achieve that in forest management by just dragging trees, the tires of logging equipment chains, stuff like that, just stirring up superficially those top couple inches of soil. Um, anyway, so uh, there was a lot of anxiety that we were going to like mess up these trails and we're gonna have to tr close the trails for a really long time and so it was just this process of you know like negotiation but really just collaboration right where we were like okay what are the issues here and how can we attenuate them so we agreed to start you know they have these summer camps that run until the end of august so we agreed to start the project project september 1st you know which i think just sort of went a long way to building that goodwill we did a walk with them where there were some special trees that they thought added to the character of their trails that were marked to be cut. And, you know, they marked off the, the trees and we, we did this walk and most of those trees were completely fine to not be cut and we didn't cut them. And I even went out, did something I've never done before, which is buy brown paint. Um, <laughs> and even Instead of just Xing them, actually like brown painting over those trees so that people don't have to look at the blue paint all the time, which is... I get it. You know, not everybody wants to look at that as they're going on their trail and and um, agreed to use different kind of equipment, cut to length system rather than um, small cable skidders that drag trees on the ground. These forwarders carry the trees over the ground on wheels. So it caused less impact to the trail surface. Agreed not to run that equipment down those gravel trails, but to just cross them. Um, and to actually corduroy them, put wood on top of them so that the tires of the equipment isn't actually on the surface of the trail. So like, I think that um, by just really like being willing to, to compromise and not just be like, you know, we're gonna shove this project on your throats, but actually be like, we're doing this together. We recognize the value of these trails to you, to the community, um, and we wanna do a really good job. I feel like uh, we've been able to like attenuate some of those conflicts before they happen. Thank you. So all of those stories did a great job of really um, thinking about how to avoid conflict. Um, so we uh, we talked about early planning and early communication and expecting collaboration. We learned from Hannah about the importance of working with your partners, um, the club, the snowmobile clubs um, that she talked about. The need for signs, um, and we'll talk more about that, but specifically in, in terms of managing unexpected recreation, signs are important. And then Ethan touched on really simply negotiations and compromising, um, which again, Ethan's example is on um, a piece of public land, which is very different than Hannah's. Um, so point to be made there. 
Are there any other tools that you see or that you've experienced in either anticipating and avoiding conflict or really getting to some resolution after a conflict that we didn't talk about? Any, any, any yes, Ethan. Yeah, I would just say that I think a lot of my education and outreach is targeted at sort of like just overwhelming people with information, you know, and number one, because I think there is and this, I cannot stress this enough. People do not like to be surprised. Uh, and just by making like a real effort to reach people in every possible kind of way and for people to have heard about something before it happens, you get rid of so many of the bad feelings right there. Um, and so I just really, I could talk more about this and provide some other resources if people are interested, um, but just really like trying to make this project or any forest management project that I do completely unavoidable. Like I want to, to pre present it in many different kinds of ways, like a local newspaper or like a YouTube video for people that don't read the local newspaper or public events for people who will go on a walk on a Saturday or a virtual event for people who aren't able to or willing to or aren't just aren't going to do that, you know? And so like, and then just really trying to do that. And I think that that um, is positive because it, it spreads the word of like the good work that we're doing and the many different things that we're managing for. And I think it also signals that our work is not something that we're ashamed of, that like this is something we're proud of and we actually want people to know more about it. We're not trying to just like hide it away because we're scared of a, a conflict. Like we're doing this work because we believe in it. And I think that it's very important that we approach our work that way. I think that there's sometimes there is um, a little bit of like a feedback loop where people see forest management work, they don't understand it. Um, because even when it's the best work ever, it looks horrible to everybody intuitively and <laughs> at least initially. Right. And, yeah. uh, and if people don't have the tools to understand it, then they freak out. And then, you know, the forest managers, the landowners see that, and then it just makes them want to hide it away. And so people are never exposed to forest management. And so they don't have any tools to understand it. And the next time <laughs> I see it, they freak out. And the same thing happens again and again and again. Right. And I'm just totally uninterested in yeah. perpetuating that cycle. So anyway, so is that, better. that adds, I actually receive, I do these extremely public forest management projects and I receive almost no negative feedback. And I think a lot of that is just because of the, just the breadth of, of outreach and sort of that signaling. Great. Thanks. Very good. So we talked with Hannah a little bit about sort of this new trend in some snowmobilers being interested in being off the trail. Can each of you describe um, how perhaps expectations of visitors has changed? Um, and if you have some experiences there, that would be great. Josh, are you seeing anything at, at the big scale on the White Mountain National Forest with expectations of visitors? Are they needing, you know, yeah. Go yeah, I was, I was thinking about this. Um, and I think, you know, there's a broader audience that we're seeing, you know, we have a wide, you know, historically on this forest, it's not been a super broad um, demographic that has uh, visited the White Mountain National Forest. And I think we're seeing uh, different preferences when people are coming to recreate. So um, instead of, you know, people looking for a quiet, desolate um, experience in the wilderness, you know, they may come with their family there and want to be able to, you know, camp with 15, 20 people, um, which is, is their um, experience that they're looking for. And um, it's a, in many cases, it's a cultural thing. And so it's something that we're, you know, seeing more and more, especially as we're get as we get, you know, we're talking about um, access to larger populations in, in our major cities. Um, we're seeing it throughout the country where we're looking and trying to find ways to, instead of having a major kind of um, impact through erosion or whatever trampling with that many people in one space, and you've got human, human waste concerns. Um, and so I think we're seeing a little bit of pressure to try to provide some sort of infrastructure um, that would support that in many cases. And, you know, we as a uh, public agency and some of our other 
uh, major uh, federal agencies have. Um, you know, there's the Recreation Enhancement Act, which uh, allows investment by people. So paying a fee to, you know, pay for um, infrastructure and different um, things where that get a lot of use. Uh, so that's a tool that we do have in some cases. But um, yeah, I, I don't see a major, sh you know, other than preferences about about that. I think um, recreation is always changing. Drone use um, is a, something that we deal with out west it's a little more difficult because of the uh, fire uh, situations causing it us to have to ground lots of uh, um, airplanes and and so our fire equipment when we're uh, over wildland fires but um, so yes I would say there is some changing preference and generally just more interest and more people um, out on the landscape looking for that recreation opportunity yeah. Cindy, do you see other expect changes, excuse me, expectations changing from your visitors on your private land? Um, I think, I don't know if it's a change, but I think, well, maybe, uh, you know, I think local folks kind of have a lot of family, friends in the uh, forest industry. So they kind of understand what these lands are all about, but people mm -hmm. coming from further afield might expect um you know the wilderness sort of situation and and then they're shocked to find out that there's active forest management going on um so yeah that that might be one thing another is the the perennial that um on on private land in maine especially that they think of it as their right to right to access rather than a privilege so we're always that's a message that we always have to um reiterate and uh again if people are respectful and can can you know meld into also having understanding rules of the road and understanding you know what's going on in these areas then it, it, it's okay but but not um think of it as a as their absolute right to do so it's, it is private land still and we have to get that message across so yeah do you find you have to repeat that message all the time because just because yeah. of its vastness really yeah exactly some folks yeah. who just they assume it's public right yeah assume it's public because it is so vast and especially in you know going through you know north main woods you might think that's sort of a park and it's it's really not a park <laughs> it's a management right. um nct or private owners so um but they do a really great job at you know educating their visitors so and we all contribute to that effort so that's always good another thing i've noticed lately though is um assuming that if you allow these uses then you must allow all uses or if not <laughs> why not so um, i've had several conversations lately with folks calling for things and having to explain, you know, why we might um, want some uses and not others. So that's an interesting conversation. Like snowmobiles versus ATVs? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Very, good. Very good. Ethan, do you have anything to add um, in terms of how, I know that during COVID, Vermont especially, and Vermont town forests really felt recreational pressure. Um, and how is it playing out in terms of, you know, what people are expecting from those town lands or from private lands that they think they can access? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the two the two big uses that I think we're really seeing explode here in Vermont are mountain biking and backcountry skiing. Um, and, you know, both of those are situations where managed well, they can be totally fine, you know, and then in both are situations where you know, you can have sort of a couple of, of bad actors, you know, kind of spoil it for everybody as well. Right. You know, mm -hmm. like I was I walked with a private landowner uh, and we were walking on their land and there was a mountain bike trail there, a well used mountain bike trail that they did not know was there. No wow. one had asked them. No one had made, you know, no one had done that. And that could just be, you know, one person. But that goes a long way towards, you know, creating less of a, a less goodwill. Right, right towards the use in general yeah. um 
And I, yeah, and just that is something like the Heinsberg Town Forest, which is a, one of the largest town forest I manage. It's um, just over 1,100 acres. Uh, they they have this ongoing question where they have recreational trail use, multi-use trails, a lot of mountain biking though, um, and you know how much they want to know how much is too much, you know, and and how do you how do you limit it and how do you make it so that it's not causing other adverse impacts that we don't want to have. And that's just a real, a real challenge, especially, you know, those town forests are, are managed by a, a committee of three to 10 volunteers, you know, and, um, and that, and that's very difficult. Um, other conflicts that we sometimes see like are, you know, conflicts, we have this thing in, in Chittenden County, which again is, is a more, um, Vermont's most, most populous county between sort of like old Chittenden County and new Chittenden County. So people who are, you know, whose families haven't been here for 200 years may have different expectations mm -hmm. of what public land is for, you know, and what they use it for than, you know, people who are, who are newer arrivals. Right. And like uh, those can sometimes create conflict. So like more old Chittenden County uses hunting, for instance, which actually we're recognizing the, the real need for this to lower deer populations. Um, but, you know, hunting versus mountain biking can sometimes cause conflicts, um, or, or other trail uses. Um, yeah. And then, and forest management, you know, which is, you know, we, we might have, we have, sometimes we have these two communities of people where it's like one community is like forest management is totally okay and expected. And the other communities like forest management is never okay. Um, and you know, by any means, and neither of those two viewpoints are correct, you know, or good or good, uh, Co cover the work the breadth of the nuanced work that we do so uh yeah so those are some of the conflicts that we deal with very good thanks everybody well let's shift gears a little bit we've talked a lot already about the need for good communication um surprises like ethan just described are not fun for any landowner um so and also ethan so uh, so articulated so well the really the greatest value in ongoing communication, ongoing education, ongoing conversations, if you will, with folks who are using our forested landscape and our managed forests for recreation to teach them about forest management, what it is, not to be afraid of, uh, to understand, even though it has its ugly moments, et cetera. So my broad question is, what do you do to actively engage your visitors with education materials? What are the specific messages you try to share? What are the physical ways in which you teach? And I know we've got three different uh, perspectives here. I'm certain that Josh has an entire staff that does this, um, as they must do all over the country. Um, Hannah, I expect that you you have to do this um, and that it, it takes a lot of uh, time that you don't necessarily want to uh, spend, perhaps. And Ethan, you've already given us some some great starting examples, but tell me a little bit about what you do, specifically proactive education about the folks that are on your lands. Well, I can give sort of a discrete example of, we have, uh, the, as I mentioned, the Dolly Cop campground is kind of situated, it's got 175 sites, extremely popular. There's people who've been going there for 70 years, that sort of thing. Um, so very popular site. We have timber sales uh, that, you know, it's situated in uh, general forest lands Our 2.1 lands is what we call them. Um, and so there will be some, uh, one of the main access routes into some of the sale areas will be um, behind the campground. And so uh, we've done quite a bit of uh, discussion internally beforehand and layout before you know going through the planning process but um and so we've actually had our foresters and timber sale administrators give uh presentations just to the general public at on saturday nights at the dolly cop campground and just talk about uh timber sales in general kind of what our goals and objectives are from a uh, management mm -hmm. standpoint and how it fits into our overall plan for the forest um, and so that's been and we do that for all of our not only uh, forestry but you know we have 
uh, recreation and wildlife um, engineer folks will, will go in and give kind of presentations to the general public, we'll publicize them. Um, and then of course, all the social media um, opportunities to, to educate folks. But um, I think that's just sort of one discrete example is where, where there's a lot of people in person. I think as Ethan mentioned, it's like um, a lot of times you can get ahead of some of those concerns. And if uh, our concessionaire, the people who run the campground are able to yeah. understand what is happening out there, they can provide that info too. So over communication is better. And I um, I, we can always get better at that, but I, I'm pretty proud of, and we reach out to the high schools and try to get the communities involved as well, just through, uh, educational, this is what forestry is. In some cases we're mimicking natural habitat. In some cases we are, um, you know, creating a little bit higher than natural habitat, uh, for wildlife and other species. And there's, you know, it, it's very, you know, well-planned and based on a lot of, um, uh, you know, literature that's gone into making the plan. So we try to get that out there as much as we can. And do you find that the audiences respond? Yeah, they, they do. And even during the actual national environmental policy act planning process, which requires uh, public involvement, the more meetings that you have, the more kind of confusion and uh, like, Oh, okay. That, that makes sense if you can connect the dots. And that's why, you know, foresters have licenses and foresters and what, like they're, that's, I think a main part of the job is to be able to take something which may seem a little bit complex, but um, be able to provide that leadership and provide that understanding of why and, and how, and not everybody is going to agree, obviously, but at least understand the basis of, for some of those decisions. Um, and then sometimes in many cases, you know, we're, we're talking to private landowners that are um, our neighbors, or we're talking to other user groups. And if we're early enough in the process, we can adjust and, um, and make, you know, better decisions because of more input. Great. Thanks. That's excellent, Josh. Hannah or Ethan, Hannah, are you ready? Yeah. So I guess a few examples. Um, for one, I, I keep bringing North Main Woods up, but they're a very important part of our recreation management, but we do um, put out a brochure through North Main Woods, which is really more of a magazine every year which has a lot of different things in it, just basic rules of the road, how to recreate in North Main Woods, but it also includes, um, you know, articles about wildlife, uh, habitat, and then we always try to get in there one or two articles about forest management. We've done different silvicultural prescriptions, you know, kind of talking down a level of, of why we do these things and what may look different and how we're mimicking natural um processes etc and we have articles with um, we speak to local contractors and logging contractors so we have that perspective um and our foresters do lots of tours uh for school groups uh, main teachers tour um different student organizations so um that's a way those aren't you know, necessarily user groups, but there's always overlap with these, you know, folks in local schools and, and who's recreating on our land. Um, another one I thought of is that uh, part of our ownership, the Allagash Wilderness Waterway runs through it. And so we have uh, twice a year, at least meetings with them to sort of outline what our plans are going to be. Uh, we can work together with them so that we're minimizing any, any impact to their users uh, paddling through and camping. And uh, there's a one example from this year is there's a trail leading into the ghost trains of Maine. And part of that is on our, our ownership, the beginning of that trail. And so, you know, we work closely with them to kind of minimize any impact uh, for that. We did buffer that trail to to sort of um, but for the impact, but also just having those discussions with uh, the superintendent of the Allagash Wilderness Waterway is valuable to sort of explain why we're doing what we're doing, what, you know, 
how we're building this road and why we're doing it here and all that kind of stuff. So those are always uh, valuable conversations to have because they, they're, they're also talking to all of their users and you kind of can make it stem out from there. So Hannah, I have two questions. One is um, I love, of course, the fact that you're hosting school groups and they tend to be local North Maine school groups. Do you ever get some that are a little bit farther away coming up to learn about um, the, the the students, so it's typically high school or college students. Oh, okay. I would say, um, but the the teacher tours that we've been involved with, and that's through the Main Tree Foundation, they go all all over, and sure. that's a valuable um, valuable way to get you know that trickle down effect of getting it into the hands of teachers and those kinds of things. Yeah. Right. And you've mentioned twice now um, the North Main Woods. Could you? For our, our for our general audience, tell us who they are, what they do, et cetera. Sure. So North Main Woods was um, established in the '70s, and essentially, the as roads were opened up, um, as we moved from log drives to overland transportation, lots of roads uh, were in the North Main Woods, <laughs> uh, and so that brought lots of recreationists to the area that didn't have access quite so easily before. So where there maybe were gates sort of internally back before that, as those opened up, North Mainwood sort of kind of made, brought the gates out to the perimeter. We call them checkpoints. Um, oh, right. Yeah, of course, the checkpoints. Brought the gates out to the perimeter, and then we can have sort of a... Um, consistent way of what you know recreation rules and and those kinds of things so it's both easy easier for the user to navigate they don't the rules are the same <laughs> everywhere um, but it also is super beneficial to the landowners who can work together to you know manage the manage the recreational use and have it not conflict with harvesting and um, that sort of thing so that's, that's basically what they are they're a nonprofit. Very good, thanks. And Ethan, you've you've talked a lot about your engagement so far. Do you have any sort of um, smaller examples of either a successful town forest or very interested private landowners who have really engaged um, in this educational opportunity that you could share with us? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, maybe not s smaller. I guess, I guess I think what, what I could share would be, um, you know, I'm actually, I'm, I'll share, would it be in the, the chat? I'll share in the chat this link to a story map. Yes, that'd that be made, great. Yep. Yeah, that I made about this um, town forest where I kind of like figured out a lot of this engagement stuff that I now do. Okay. Um, one thing that I would say just generally that I've realized, what, what I say, my like little tagline is, I think that everybody is supportive of forest management. They just don't know it yet right mm -hmm. we haven't told them in a way that they understand right and show them in a way that they understand that they love forest management but but they do it's just about figuring out what that is so i think you know one thing that i really explored in that project that's in that story map there that you can look into if you're interested um you know you do these we would do events right and like you do a public event and you say come visit an active timber sale, or as, as I've started to call them, a forest management project. Um, come visit a forest management project, you know, and, and you get 12 right. people. Great. You know, and then you do it again and you get eight people, you know, and then I sort of had this light go on when I went uh, with my friend Andrea, who's a wildlife biologist. We were like, we'll do a wildlife walk. It's the same walk. It's called a wildlife walk. And there's a wildlife biologist there, 40 people. Uh -huh. And I was like, Okay, oh. how far we can take this. And so now I don't do any events that are just about forest management. I do I do them about carbon and climate change. I do them about birding and managing forests for bird habitat. Um, also became an Audubon endorsed forester, basically for that reason. Um, I, I do them about wildlife. I do them about emerald ash borer. Um, I also have gotten really excited about uh, exploring traditional partnerships and also non-traditional partnerships. Mm -hmm. So like 
traditional partnerships here in Vermont, Vermont Land Trust, for instance, Audubon Vermont. Those would be sure. like the traditional ones and, you know, similar, similar organizations in Maine and New Hampshire, New York. Uh, and, and that, you know, when we do an event with the Vermont Land Trust and we, or with Audubon Vermont, it really shows the collaboration and like that partnership. It's not just me. I'm a forester. I hate trees. I want to cut them all down. It's like, here we are with this coalition of different organizations and we all are, are figuring out the answers to these nuanced questions and we're like on the same page. So that goes a long way. And then I started just thinking about who else I could ask, you know? And, and so one of my favorite ones is I, I now once a year, a couple times a year, I do what's called a pride hike with um, Vermont Pride Center and Outright Vermont, which are two like LGBTQ advocacy organizations that do this, this hike series. And we do these walks, you know, with organizations that, that serve a community, which has never been asked if they're interested right. in forest management, right. you know, and we do it on active, active forest management project with loggers and skid trails and all this stuff. And it's always great, you know, and it's like, you know, I've, I've started to think about that. We do, I do walks with the local co-op, you know, and, and uh, I think that that just think, thinking about how we can like expand our coalition, you know, and like, frame the educational offerings in different ways to get people to show up for stuff and engage with stuff rather than just sitting at home and thinking whatever they think about forest management, I think is extremely powerful. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's what I would say. And, and if people are interested in learning more about that, I'm going to, so there's that story map, which has some more information about that, that I just posted. And here's a story map about the project that I'm doing at right now at the Cabinet Community Forest, which has some additional tools. Right. And, um, we will capture all these links that Ethan's giving us and you will get that in your follow-up information. So as usual, the discussion's fabulous and the time is uh, uh, slipping by here. So thanks all. I think it's time. I think that we should switch to question and answers now, but thanks for great discussion so far. And I'm going to look at what I've got in the Q and A and pose questions to the panelists. So we, um, Ethan, we have two questions related to your experience with town forests. Um, one is, does Vermont have a listing or statewide organization for its town forests? And then secondly, enlarging the question about how about other New England states? And I'll just say the center's work in town and community forests, um, New Hampshire has a good inventory, but like it's not like there's a list we're going to give you of town forests. I don't think the list exists in really an e easily accessible way. Maine definitely doesn't have a list, though they, they do a survey all the time. Vermont may be in the process of an inventory these days, but no yeah. list. Um, but you can reach to us at the center. And Ethan, do you have any other resource ideas for this person who asked that question? Yeah, I know that um, in 2015, which was a hundred year anniversary of the enabling legislation that allowed towns to acquire town forests in Vermont, they did an inventory, but um, it, it's definitely not all of them. And there, there have been some since then, have been some that left out that were left out. And so I think I think it is in process, um, but there's no there, like one place you can go and see them all on a map and have right. everything right there. I will say proudly that I believe uh, Vermont has about 68,000 acres of town-owned land. New Hampshire is the winner, 180,000 acres of town-owned land, representing 3% of the state's land base. Um, Maine does not have a comprehensive inventory, but we're certain that it's over 150,000 acres um, for a combined three-state total of over 400,000 acres, which is an incredible number. Uh, for small local controlled uh, managed um, town town lands that provide recreational and, and and all other benefits. So thanks for the question about town forests. Um, next question is, um, I'm literally going to read these. So it is great that such a big part of Ethan's time and energy is focused on education and outreach. It's so important for helping recreationalists and other users understand and appreciate forest management. And as he said, not something that foresters have done historically or like to do. Could the panel reflect on the importance of communications and how they or others are working to bring these skill sets into their organizations and work? Anybody have some thoughts about? Uh, can I just tell a quick story and then I'll yes. let Hannah and Josh. Um, 
So I really thought about um, my sort of like moment when I really realized the importance of communication, especially, but it's important before we do a project, especially, it's also important after, right? Mm -hmm. And like, so I was visiting my mom and she was like, oh, on this piece of public land near me, um, they did some forest management and I want you to look at it, you know, cause I was at that time I was in forestry school. And so we went and walked around and there was, you know, this piece of public land, people walking around in it. And they had just done the previous winter, they had just done some forest management. So it was super fresh, you know, it's like that time period when it's like, it looks, it's never going to look any worse than it looks like the first spring. After right. Thing. Um, and I couldn't figure out for the life of me, what exactly had happened um, or, you know, what the goals were, what situations they were responding to, what they were trying to do. Like, and I, and I was like, you know, I'm a forester, you know, and I, I didn't, I couldn't figure it out. And so it, I saw the other people walking around on these trails and I was like, what hope do these people have <laughs> of like understanding this incredibly nuanced, complex work? Like, how are they going to know if we don't tell them? Right. And, and so I think that that, that in particular experience really made me want to get into signage. Um, also educational, you know, other ways of like sharing information after the fact, but like, I want, when people look at, let's say a group selection, let's say it's a quarter acre area, all the trees have been cut. Uh, I want there to be a sign there in that moment where they're like, what the heck? I want there to be a sign there that tells them what the heck, you know, that right. like, I think of it as like giving them the tools to understand the work that we do. Um, okay. And I think we need to recognize that if, if we don't do that actively, they're, they're not going to figure it out on their own. They're just going to, it might make things worse. You know, it might, it, they might just think whatever they think already about the work that we do, which might be negative, you know, and, and away they'll go. All right. Thanks, Ethan. Josh, how are your foresters doing? Do you make them interact with people? Yeah, we have a, a, a great staff, actually, of uh, foresters and silviculturists that are pretty passionate about the work that they do. And so, you know, we're we are heading out in many cases to, you know, among the public meetings that we're required um, to do uh, also out to the local communities. We, you know, in addition to just the. Um, the specialists like the foresters um, providing insight. We, we have staff of what we call NEPA or uh, National Environmental Policy Act mm -hmm. coordinators who are I, the team leaders that uh, set up these meetings, reach out to our partners, uh, provide updates, answer questions. Uh, we, we hold webinars like this uh, for, we've started doing that since COVID um, and been able to reach a broader audience in some cases. Um, open houses um, where foresters are there. Um, each of our, um, any timber sale that occurs on national forest lands has a silvicultural uh, prescription written for it. So, you know, Ethan mentioned group selection, single tree selection, um, patch cuts, that sort of thing. Um, irregular shelter wood, although we don't necessarily have a, <laughs> uh, that in our repertoire at the moment, but um so each of all of our documents that uh, approve these this type of work is available for for public comment before the project is um, right. implemented, and so we try to as much as we can. And I, I kind of alluded to it previously. I, it can, maybe it sounds like we have this enormous kind of staff that has all the time in the world to um, to to do this, but we we do struggle as many folks up in the North Country do with uh, staffing to fill. Maybe we have a box on the organization chart for this, right. but in many cases, it's people like foresters who are doing wearing a million hats, uh, also doing the public service. So I think, or excuse me information sure um so yeah very good thanks josh and hannah what's your organization's commitment to this ongoing communication need so this is this is something i would say we're we're working on getting better at in a sense of explaining what we do you know why we're doing it it's not one of them said that you know a very passionate group of foresters probably both of you did um we do too and they want to share their knowledge and they want to they want people to understand. And a couple of examples with signage, uh, we had a 
we were part of a study program and we did a prescribed burn on a rather visible <laughs> location. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we put up a kiosk and explained, you know, what the study was all about, what we were trying to achieve, why we did it, what we're looking for in the future. Um, and we had another harvest that happened on a, I'll call it a well-used corridor because we don't have sanctioned trails, <laughs> hiking trails, but um, we know that folks are are walking in this location. And so um, we did a, 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 you know, close harvest there. And so uh, one of our foresters in the Rangeley district initiated, um, he's like, I, I want to explain what I've done here. I want people to know. I want them to understand uh, because as um, Ethan said, it sometimes doesn't look great at first, especially if you know nothing about forestry. Um, and so, you know, we made signage to explain what was happening and the and, and the reasons why and, and what we would be doing in the future. So I think all that's really important because people don't know. And it's it's pretty cool to see. I've seen on other landowners, you know, they they put up, you know, this was harvested X number of years ago and it's and it's not where you thought it would be when you first saw it. So I think all that's really helpful getting the message across. Yeah, excellent examples. Thanks, Hannah. All right, the next questions come from the Adirondacks. Um, And again, forgive me, I'm reading. Uh, What efforts are planned to keep mountain hiking trails from erosion due to overuse? And many, um, sorry, that didn't make sense. Many Adirondack mountain trails are in poor condition. So how are we taking care of those trails, particularly in light of erosion? And I magically reached to a colleague in the Adirondacks and she said, this is a real challenge. The new trail up Mount Van Hovenberg, hope I said that right, is an example of trying to set a new model for trail standards in the Adirondacks. But addressing older trails is challenging and requires investment and trail work. With older trails often headed straight up the slope, we have a legacy of poor trail planning to contend with. Um, and of course, that's causing the need for some rerouting. So thank you for that question. The second question in the Adirox refers to uh, public use bicycle trails on Lyme forest easements in the Tupper Lake area. And we know nothing and have nothing to report on that private land. So thank you for your question. Um, and back to a uh, main question. So Hannah, this might be for you. Um, are there elements of the North Main Woods model, which you described as a nonprofit management of recreation across multiple private lands, that could be replicated in other parts of the Northern Forest, especially in areas of higher recreation interest? Does that even cover your Rangeley area, or what do you think about that? Um, it, it does not currently cover our Rangeley area. You mean, does North Main Woods cover our Rangeley area? Or yeah, Right, so the, the, the question was, can this be replicated? And my thought was, I bet it doesn't cover her lands in Rangeley. So is that a place where rep- replication might be useful of that yeah. model? Oh, sure, we, we, would, <laughs> we would love it. It's a super useful model. Um, I don't know. How to do that. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. <laughs> but yes, I mean, North Main Woods has been looked at, at, you know, private landowners across the country have looked to them for an example of how to, okay. how to do how to do that. Um, I don't know if it's been repl- replicated elsewhere, mm-hmm. um, but it, it, is, it isn't a very good model. <laughs> all right, we have gone through all of the questions that were submitted. So, uh, final chance for panelists to interact. Do we have any questions for each other? Do you have any closing comments or closing thoughts that you'd like to share with our participants today? I would just say, I mean, people have talked about it a lot today, but communication and getting out ahead of things. Um, we're involved with lots of different stakeholder groups. Um, for things. And so all of the problems that I may have talked about, many have been avoided (laughs) that are hard to say because you get ahead of it and and try to try to work with people and get things figured out before they become an issue. So that's always so important. Good advice. Any advice from Ethan or or Josh and closing thoughts? I would uh, just say that, you know, all landowners are have different objectives and are seeing uh, different pressures on their respective landscapes, whether they're public or private. But I would put in a plug for all of the um, 
the land management agencies. We have a research bra branch, a state and private forestry that uh, provides all kinds of insight for folks that are struggling with these issues. We're I'm part of the national forest system, which we manage a specific land base. But you know, call your local national forest if you're you know you want to if you have questions or um, any interest. We're a public agency that is um, here to serve the public. That's what we got into this business for. And we can also certainly get you in touch. There's so many resources out there right now. I know NRCS, um, which is another USDA uh, group. Natural Great. Resource Conservation Service. There's there's just a lot, not just funding, which is available, but also um, expertise. And please uh, use it. I think, yeah, I, that would be my advice for folks struggling with these issues. Thank you, Josh. Ethan, closing thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I just think uh, with recreation, I just really, really believe that that if we set our minds as, you know, forest stewards, land managers, people who work for NGOs, you know, that that we can, you know, recreation is an opportunity, I believe, to, to forest management, to forest stewardship. And I think it's just about us sort of understanding that you know and and also part of it is like um reframing like the work that we do helping people understand what forest management is and how nuanced it is and all the different things that we manage for and uh you know if we can like embrace some of those apparent conflicts you know things that now seem like conflicts with recreational trail users with recreational trails with forests that have trail networks that seem really intimidating. I feel like, you know, we approach it in a really good way. I feel like there's a real opportunity there, you know, to sort of like help people understand, um, you know, the future, our future forest, our future forestry, right. That we're trying, that we're trying to do. Uh, and uh, I don't think that we're going to do that by just, you know, hiding our work away, right. you know, and putting it in places where nobody will ever see it. Um, I, I just don't I just can't believe that that's the case. And so I think that we really need to think about how to how to leverage recreational trail usage into a better understanding of, of forest management. And I would say that also, you know, like I don't it's just me here, you know, and, and I've just kind of like figured out how to do some of these different things to make edu educational science and like YouTube videos and if there are other organizations out there who want to do similar outreach, I will give you everything that I have. Uh, so if you reach out to me and I'll like give you signed templates and I'll give you, I'll teach you how to make a, a YouTube video in 15 minutes and you know, any, anything else that I have and happy to, to be a resource if that's helpful, because I just really think we need to kind of lean into this thing. I think it, I really do think it's an opportunity. Very good. What a wonderful way to close our discussion. Thank you all to our panelists. You're all wonderful. Thank you for sharing your expertise, your uh, energy, your enthusiasm, and your commitment to this topic. I really appreciate your time today, especially. Um, and thank you to our uh, webinar participants. Thank you for joining us. I hope that this was a highlight of your day today. or always a pleasure to have you. I want to thank our funders. Today's webinar was made possible by funding support by the Northern Border Regional Commission, as well as the U.S. Forest Service. And I remind attendees that you will be getting a follow-up email with the recordings of this session, plus some of the resources, for, like uh, Ethan had given us some links, et cetera, plus links to the future webinars. You see up in front of you now our upcoming webinar on October 17th about animating your community through the arts. We'll have a conversation on how public art helps build a welcoming and engaged community. And we'll hear from leaders across the region about how art has transformed their communities. And then later in November, on November 15th, the next webinar topic is Winter Trail Maintenance, Responding to User Expectations and a clean, Changing Climate. And that conversation will be about managing trails through the winter months while addressing adaptations to climate change, including safety, multi-use considerations, and more. So at 1.30 p.m., I wish you a good day and thank you very much for joining us. Bye.